after being embarrassed by the Utah Jazz losing by 30 points in game one of the opening round of the 1999 NBA playoffs, one shot by Chris Webber sends a message and changes the series for the Sacramento Kings. On today's Locked on Kings podcast, we'll look at game two and three of this Kings Jazz 1999 series, how things turned around in the Sacramento Kings favor, and they earned their first home playoff win in the history of the Sacramento era of the Kings. It's all on today's episode of the Locked on Kings podcast. You are Locked on Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time. Time for another episode of Locked on Kings. Hello and welcome to Locked on Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all regular season and all off season. If you're looking for in-depth analysis, game-by-game breakdowns, highlights, interviews with local and national experts, full coverage of the Sacramento Kings from January through December, this is the place for you, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I've been a Sacramento sports media member, Sacramento Kings media member for the last seven years. This will be my eighth season covering the Kings, uh, formerly as an on-air radio host, now as a uh, or working in television for ABC10. So very excited to... Uh, Uh, start my first season covering the Kings, working for ABC 10. Uh, But for those of you who have been with me here on Locked on Kings for the last five years or so, uh, you know the kind of coverage that I provide. For those of you who are new, welcome in. During the regular season and when there's big King stories happening, of course, we focus on the present. But at times, like downtime at the end of an offseason, We like to take a look at the past. And if you missed part one of my three-part series on the 1999 NBA playoffs, Basically, I I put out there, I want to do a one episode, a deep dive into a a former Kings playoff series. And I asked which series that uh, listeners wanted me to go back and and, and cover. And so many of you requested the 1999 uh, playoff series because it really was the beginning of the greatest show on core era for the Sacramento Kings. And as I started doing research and, and trying to format this into one episode, I realized that these games were just too good. There was too much context to squeeze all into one episode. So I decided to make it a three-part series. Part one is, uh, it was released on Wednesday, correct? Yes, Wednesday. Uh, and it covers uh, the regular season battles between these two teams and then game one. Today was actually supposed to be yesterday's episode. And I apologize that we did not get that episode out in time. Uh, Some of you might know that I recently had a newborn child, uh, and sometimes baby stuff gets in the way, unless you wanted a screaming child in the background. uh, I don't think you wanted to have to deal with that. So I apologize for the delay here of the second episode, Uh, and if it looks like I'm tired, it's because I am. New parents or parents in general, (laughs) you know what it is that I'm talking about. But we're soldiering on, making sure I'm getting the second episode out for you. Episode three will now be tomorrow, Saturday, or at least that's the plan. Uh, And I'm also doing an NBA 2K22 giveaway. And today's episode, Friday, was supposed to be when I announced the winner. Um, And I am pushing that back one more day. So you have time to enter. And I'll explain at the end of this podcast, if you don't know how you can enter for a chance to win a copy of NBA 2K22. But now that we got all that stuff out of the way, let's dive back into this 1999 opening round of the playoffs for the Sacramento Kings. So to recap, the Kings and uh, uh, Utah Jazz played three times during the regular season. All three games went into overtime. All three games contained an altercation. Uh, Two out of the three games were played in Sacramento, and the Kings went one and two against the Jazz in those three games. At this time, the Kings were a new team. Uh, Chris Webber's first season in Sacramento, Vlad Divot's first season in Sacramento. Jason Williams was a rookie. Peja Stoyakovich was technically a rookie. He was drafted two years earlier, uh, but spent two more years playing in Greece before coming over to Sacramento. So he's playing his first season with the Kings. Scott Pollard is new with the Kings. Rick Adelman is the new head coach. Uh, so very, very different. Very young. Sacramento Kings team who likes to play fast and likes to score and, and is very different from the set established old style of the Stockton and Malone led Utah Jazz that were starting their decline 
We didn't know it at the time because Carl Malone was the MVP of uh, the NBA that season. But this was starting to be the beginning of the end of that golden era for Stockton and Malone. And you could start to see some of the cracks in their armor in games two and three, like we're going to talk about. But in game one, the Kings or this new team, first time the Kings have been in the playoffs in a couple of seasons. They're excited. They're trying to uh, to establish themselves, and they get absolutely destroyed, embarrassed, really, uh, by the Utah Jazz in Game 1 in Utah. You could see that the stage was just a little bit too much for them. Maybe not necessarily that. It was a position that the Utah Jazz were very comfortable in that this new Sacramento Kings team was not, and it showed right from the very beginning. So going into game two, Chris Weber had actually told the media that he personally was embarrassed in game one and it won't happen again. And it's what he does after saying that at the beginning of game two, that one makes that game and really the series so famous. And two, it, it completely echoes what he says and it changes the series, at least temporarily in the Sacramento Kings favor. So unlike game one, Game two, the Kings start with a fast pace on both ends. In game one, the Kings still did try to play fast, but they played sloppy, disorganized, uh, and were trying to beat the Utah Jazz at their own game. And that's going to be important because in game two, that flips with Utah trying to beat the Kings at their game. The Kings struggled to score the basketball in game one after being the only team in the NBA to average over 100 points per game. Their average was like 100.3 or 100.4. They were the only team to average triple digits, so they won based off of their scoring. Defensively, they were like second worst in the NBA. So they needed to win games based off of scoring, or at least that was going to be the philosophy. And you could see the energy and the intensity, the focus of the Kings trying to play their game from the opening tip. But really, it doesn't take too long for this game to take a turn and for this moment that I'm alluding to to happen. And those of you uh, who have followed this series or remember this series know exactly what I'm talking about. I'll get there uh, in just a second. The Kings shoot 68% from the field in the first quarter, trying to just outwork the Jazz. Again, this is on both ends of the floor. Defensively, they're not playing lockdown defense. They're just trying to be pests. They're moving. They're quick. They're not allowing the Jazz to get the ball to their spots uh, as they, they did so easily in game one. Chris Weber in the first quarter picks up two quick fouls. The exact same happened in game one. Chris Weber picking up two quick fouls, getting into foul trouble. That really limited what he could do for the Sacramento Kings. Except this time, his two quick fouls, one is very different. The first one is very different. The first one, a flagrant foul. Weber shoulder checking John Stockton as he cuts into the lane. If you haven't seen this moment, it's so easy to find. You can find a full like full version of the game on YouTube. You will probably find the moment itself on YouTube too. But if you look up uh, Jazz Kings 1999 playoffs game two, in the first eight minutes of the video, but in the first couple minutes of the actual game itself, John Stockton is cutting to the lane. And remember, Chris Webber has told the media that he was embarrassed and he will not let it happen again. So John Stockton, wily, tough, but annoying John Stockton is cutting to the basket. And Chris Weber just gives him a nice, hard shoulder check that, quite honestly, in today's NBA, if you were to do that, you would be ejected. Back then, it was just a flagrant foul. So a message is sent by this shoulder check from Chris Weber. It really is a message that tells the Utah Jazz and tells the rest of the NBA, look, us losing by 30 points in game one, which I believe was the worst loss in playoff history for the Kings. Not just the Sacramento Kings, the Kings period, going all the way back to Kansas City and Rochester. Like the worst playoff loss in that franchise's history. Chris Webber was embarrassed by that. He and this new young Kings team are determined to say, we're not going to be any pushovers. And by the way, there's already bad blood between these two teams because of how all three regular season games went. So Chris Webber decides to take it upon himself as the leader of this Kings team, a young leader, his first year with the Sacramento Kings. He decides to take it upon himself and send a message, a hard shoulder check that knocks Stockton to the ground. And Stockton takes a while to get up. This moment is pretty interesting because the Jazz are on offense. Weber shoulder checks Stockton. And then Weber jogs up to the other end of the floor. Like he knows what he did. 
He has no arguments with it. He fully expects the uh, the flagrant foul. No issue with anything. He knows exactly what he did, and he jogs up to the under end of the floor intentionally to avoid altercations with anybody on Utah. And I'm really surprised that nobody on Utah followed him to try and uh, have words with him because it was very clear what Weber was trying to do with this move. There's no way to analyze this with purple glasses on and say this wasn't a dirty shot. It 100% was a dirty shot by Chris Weber, which was a lot more acceptable and expected in the NBA then compared to today. Definitely a dirty shot, but a shot that was necessary. Necessary to send a message to the rest of the league, but also Weber was sending a message to his teammates saying, look, th- this is we're not going to be pushovers. This is who we are. This is who we have to be. And that moment would not only spark a Kings reaction immediately with the first quarter that I said the Kings had, but for the next two games. Now, I also, researching this moment, I came across a lot of articles from a Utah Jazz perspective that said that John Stockton wasn't the same after this shot for the remainder of the series. He just, he wasn't the same, which I think, I mean, I I wasn't, I don't, remember the context of that day, but watching these games, he didn't look that different. I know it took him a little bit longer to get up and he struggled in games two and three, but as many of you know, he has a big moment in game four and is instrumental in game five. So I think that's more narrative and and excuse making by the Utah Jazz as to why they were struggling as much as they did in games two and three. And when I asked G-Man about it later on in the podcast, the G-Man Gary Gerald will join me on all three of these episodes. He's going to talk about games two and three. He's going to talk about that moment. And he's going to talk about how he remembers John Stockton faring and performing after that shot by Chris Weber. But it made an immediate impact for the Sacramento Kings. They outscored the Jazz 31-24 to in the first quarter. However, this moment, the the energy that the Kings play with in the first quarter, the strength, the, the positivity of how they play in that first quarter, it doesn't last all game long. The Utah Jazz being the composed team that they are, they get their stuff together in the second quarter. I'll get there though. Chris Weber also benefited from this moment, firing himself up because he scored only 14 points in the game one loss. He had 11 points by the end of the first quarter. So Chris Weber not only had the shot, he backed up what the message that he was trying to send and what he did by continuing to play physical. And he played for the majority of the first quarter with two fouls. And in his credit, he didn't pick up a third. The Utah Jazz, though, would close the gap in the second quarter with a 27 to 18 second quarter. They slowed the pace down after the Kings were trying to play fast, get up and down the floor uh, in the first quarter. And they actually led 51 to 49 at halftime which people think of game two and spoiler alert, they think of the Kings winning game two. They see the shot by Chris Weber in the strong first quarter that the Kings had. They think, okay, the Kings were in control of this game. No, Utah actually closed the gap. But in the second half, the Kings got back to what they were doing in the first quarter. And they continued even during the second quarter where they were struggling and the shots weren't falling as much. They still continued to play their game. And Utah was almost forced to match them on their home floor, which is pretty impressive to do against an established team led by Stockton and Malone. The lead would change 11 times in this game, but only three times in the second half. The back and forth was really in that first quarter and in that second quarter. The Kings would take a lead on a Vernon Maxwell jumper with 49 seconds left in the third, and the lead wouldn't change again. The Kings would be in control for the remainder of the game. But how did the Kings go to fall behind in the second quarter? It's because they had a scoring drought of over six straight minutes. So Utah picked uh, picked up the intensity defensively, and Sacramento, the shots just weren't falling as they were in the first quarter. So that's what allowed Utah to work their way back in the game. But in the second half, the Kings figure things out. Vernon Maxwell, like I said, hits that jumper uh, late in the third quarter, and the Kings are in control for the remainder of this game. The Kings would go on to build an 11-point lead at one point in the fourth quarter, building a nice cushion. That's not how the final score would end. The Utah tries to make a little bit of a push back, but the Kings hold the Utah Jazz just 14 points in the fourth quarter while scoring 23 of their own, leading to a Kings victory of 11 points, 101-90. to To defeat the Utah Jazz in Utah 
by double digits after losing by 30 just two days before and to score over 100 points on Utah, which is one of the best defenses in the NBA. That in addition to the shot by Chris Webber, that in addition to that shot sent a major message to Utah and to the rest of the league. So back we go to Sacramento, or we head to Sacramento now. The series tied one to one. And the Kings showing that they're not going to be pushovers. They're going to be very serious players. Chris Webber dominated in this game, 20 points, seven assists, five rebounds. Jason Williams, who was unimpressive in game one going up against John Stockton, the rookie point guard, finished with 18 points, three assists. Vlade Divac a near triple double. And Vlade was amazing in this series, just period. He struggled in game one. He was outplayed by Greg Ostertag. Game two through five, he was the better big man, and it wasn't close. 18 points, eight assists, seven rebounds for Vlade in this game. Carl Malone d- did his thing. The MVP had 33 points, 10 rebounds. John Stockton, despite getting hit, uh, still managed 13 points uh, and six assists. The Kings were the second worst scoring defense in the NBA that season, and they held the Utah Jazz to 39% from the field. But 39% from the field for that Utah Jazz. At the time, that was a big deal. And Jerry Sloan actually said, I found a clip of uh, on ESPN, the post-game broadcast uh, on ESPN, and, and they had a clip of Jerry Sloan talking to the media. And he said, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, he said that the Jazz played with the idea that they were going to stop the Kings at their own game. So Jerry Sloan recognized right away that instead of doing what they did in game one, playing their game and forcing the Kings to match and obviously being better at that, They tried to beat the young guys at their own fast-paced game in their own building. Maybe came into game two with a little bit of cockiness and arrogance. And they just weren't able to match that. So the series, like I said, is tied one-to-one heading back to Sacramento. The Kings' first home playoff game in a few years. It would be a night of major firsts for our city. We'll talk about game two here in just a little bit. Before that, though, or rather game three in just a little bit. But before that... I want to let you know that today's episode is brought to you by Direct TV Stream. Let me know if this sounds familiar. You've got one device that lets you catch the game live. You have another that lets you stream your favorite shows. You're watching sports highlights on your phone, and you've got your neighbor's best friends log in for all the other good stuff. I want to let you know that there's a simple way to get all that entertainment that you love without the hassle and a great way to finally get all your TV together in one place. It's called Direct TV Stream, and it brings you live TV and on-demand favorites together like never before, so you can watch your favorite sports, movies, and shows all in one place. This means no more juggling remotes, no need to buy another device ever again, and the best part, there's no annual contract. So get rid of the clutter and the confusion and get your TV together with Direct TV Stream. You can learn more at directtv.com. That's directtv.com. Compatible devices required. Content varies by package. The Locked On Kings podcast is also brought to you by Sleeper. In 2018, the fantasy sports experts at Sleeper realized that fantasy basketball was just straight up broken. Games were being won and lost based on whose players had more scheduled games that week. It made no sense and it required very little strategy. So in 2020, Sleeper released a brand new way of playing fantasy basketball. It's called Game Pick and it's only available on Sleeper. In Game Pick, owners pick a single game per week for each of their starters to count towards their team's total score, ensuring an even number of games played between opponents, a level playing field. The days of losing because your opponent's players simply had more scheduled games, those days are over. The days of mindless daily busy work setting your lineups are over. The days of giving up halfway through the season because of that busy work, they're over. Whether you prefer redraft, keeper, or dynasty, Game Picks has you covered. Sleeper cracked the fantasy basketball code, and if you play fantasy football, preferring that weekly strategy versus daily busy work, you're going to love Game Picks. Download the Sleeper app and start a league with your friends today. You will not be disappointed. May 12, 1999, Game 3 of the Kings and Jazz Series tied at 1, and it is played inside a rabid Arco Arena, And I can't even explain to you how many times I got chills watching this game, hearing that crowd, feeling that energy. It was an environment very similar to when the Kings made the playoffs for the first time a couple of seasons before that, taking on uh, the Seattle Supersonics. It's an environment that I imagine is going to be picked up tenfold when the Kings finally do make the playoffs after this long current playoff drought that they're in. This fan base excited, especially after what happened in game two. And remember at this time, it was just a five game series or best of five series. 
So suddenly the Kings have the next two games at home. They win both and they move on. They just sent a message. They have this young, exciting team that outperformed. And at the end of the regular season, the Kings won 10 of their final 11 games, including a five-game winning streak uh, to wrap up the regular season. So this team had a lot going for it. There was a lot of reason to be excited in Sacramento. So the energy in this game from start to finish is just absolutely incredible. So if you get the chance to go and watch game three, many consider it their favorite of the series. One, because of the result uh, and, and two, just because of that energy. Um, and right out of the gate, the Kings continued to frustrate the Jazz with their high energy, except this time they were taking some of that energy from that rabid crowd. No longer were they doing it in a hostile environment. They were playing their own game in their own building behind a fan base who was ready to scream and yell and do everything that they could, uh, including every time Carl Malone stepped at the free throw line, counting to 10 plus, similar to how fans were doing uh, with Giannis Antetokounmpo in the playoffs this season. Uh, they were counting to 10 with how slow Carl Malone was to take free throws. Now, Carl Malone was also one of the best free throw shooters uh, in the NBA. In fact, during the regular season, he led the league in free throw attempts. He got to the line more than anybody else. And speaking of good free throw shooters, we know John Stockton almost never missed a free throw in his career. Uh, so the Kings would have some fun with the Utah Jazz when they would step uh, to the free throw line. But this time, the Kings are playing with the same high energy that they had uh, in the, the opening minutes of Game 2 in Utah. But this time, the shots aren't falling. And yet the Kings are still able to create some separation because that energy is transferring to how they're playing on the defensive end of the floor. Now, in both Game 2 and Game 3, the games were still played primarily on the inside. That's just the way the NBA uh, was played at that time. It was played very inside out, not outside in uh, like it is today. But both teams are trying to force the issue, be physical on the inside, and neither side is hitting shots. But the fact that the Sacramento Kings could come out of the gate struggling offensively and still be able to maintain a lead speaks to just how good this team was, even if they didn't know it yet and hadn't reached their full potential yet. Because typically in, in a series like this, if you have a team that is one of the worst defensively in the league but scores a boatload of points, they're just obviously going to try and outscore you to beat you, especially in the playoffs against an established team like uh, the Utah Jazz are. Well, this time they didn't just rely on their scoring. The scoring wasn't there, but they didn't allow drop-off on the defensive end of the floor, which that's a lesson that this current Sacramento Kings team uh, could learn. The Jazz would finish the game with only one starter, which is Carl Malone, three total players in double figures scoring. The Kings established themselves defensively and gave the Utah Jazz Fitz, John Stockton, who again took that shot in game two, and the Jazz argue was never the same after that, never the same in the playoff series, not for his career. John Stockton, just five points. Brian Russell, just five points. Jeff Hornacek, just four points. Greg Ostertag, just three points. Those were the other starters beside Carl Malone who had like 20 plus. And then there were a couple players on the Utah Jazz bench uh, that finished with like 11 or 12 points. The Kings outscored the Jazz 28 to 17 in the first quarter, despite the fact that shots weren't falling. But the problem is, from that point on, they didn't score 20 points or more in a single quarter. So they have this great first quarter, but from that point on, they're in the teens. Like, it was difficult, difficult to score the ball for both teams in this game. The Kings led for 42 minutes of this one. But the Jazz also did well to hang around. They never looked like they were in control. They never looked like they were the better team. But they were always stuck around. It's because the Kings were struggling to hit shots. The Kings never created enough separation to really run away with this game. Had they hit shots at their normal rate, this game would have been an absolute blowout. The Kings shot 38%. They shot 6 of 25 from three-point range. And remember, the Kings led the NBA at this time in three-point uh, attempts per game, which was like 18. The Kings were trying to change the way they played. They played a lot on the perimeter. However, in this game, taking 25 threes, making only six of them, like I said, that number just goes up a little bit more. They make 10 of those. They make 11 of those. This game's a comfortable win for Sacramento. But what the positive for the Kings is that even though they're struggling to shoot, they're not allowing those struggles to transfer to the defensive end as the Jazz shot 37%. But the Jazz only shot three of nine from three-point range. I think that that 
difference in three-point shooting between the Kings and the Jazz is so eye-opening. 25 three-pointers for the Kings in this game. Attempts, nine attempts for the Utah Jazz. Unfortunately, the Kings only made three more three-pointers than the Utah Jazz did. But it was a complete battle on the inside. Just an absolute war in the trenches. Vladi Divac, Greg Ostertag, Carl Malone, Chris Webber, Scott Pollard, everybody just brawling, pushing, and shoving on the inside as much as they can. Now, not actually fighting, but the game was very, very physical, and all the scoring was around the rim, or at least uh, on mid-range. The Kings led from 925 in the first quarter. At the 925 mark in the first quarter, they had a lead all the way until five minutes and 23 seconds remaining in the game. That's how long they were in control. But again, Utah was able to just hang around. And suddenly, they closed the gap. They steal the lead. And in the fourth quarter, there's panic setting in of, oh man, the Kings, because they're struggling to score, is it finally going to catch up to them? Are the Utah Jazz finally now going to flip that switch? They know how to be in these uh, high-pressure situations. They know what they're doing. They also are trying to avenge their loss in Game 2. They're going to figure this one out. It looks like they were going to. They actually took a lead late. The Kings are trailing 77-75 to with only a few seconds remaining or around like 20 seconds remaining or something like that. And Vlade Divac is fouled, trying to score on the inside. He's fouled. He steps to the line. Vlade hits two clutch free throws to tie the game at 77 with 29 seconds remaining. And the Utah Jazz, they'd have a couple of good looks uh, at winning this game. Two different looks, actually. Uh, Howard Isley missed a uh, a game-winning three-point attempt. Offensive rebound, and Carl Malone gets us a good mid-range jumper shot from like 17 feet. He rims that out. And of course, for the first time this series, but for the fourth time between these two teams, this game goes to overtime. But think about that. A 48-minute regulation basketball game goes to overtime 77 to 77. That kind of low scoring game plays completely into the favor, completely into the favor of the Utah Jazz. And yet the Kings were in control for 42 minutes of it. Now I could also spin that and look at the other side and say, man, the Kings are now going to overtime in a game that they led for 42 minutes of. That's unfortunate. And to be honest with you, going into overtime, I'm sure many in Sacramento felt that the Kings had missed their chance, that now they were in overtime, these important moments, even if they are at home, these are the moments that the Utah Jazz are comfortable in, that they know how to win these games. Every single overtime possession for the Sacramento Kings was in the post. And it was so weird to watch because at least during the regular uh, regulation, 48 minutes, sometimes it was outside, sometimes it was inside. Like I said, the Kings took 26 threes. In overtime, it was... Weber post, Weber post, Vlade post, Vlade post. That was it. That was it. And it's just so jarring to watch that kind of basketball with modern NBA basketball where you almost see no post play. Or if you do, it's to draw defenses in so you can kick out for an open three-pointer, right? Chris Weber actually fouled out of this game with a minute left in overtime. And Vlade then took over. And Vlade was the hero for the Kings in this game. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. He hit back-to-back clutch hook shots with less than a minute remaining. The Utah Jazz had a chance at the free throw line to cut into the Kings' lead. They missed free throws. John Stockton had a look at a potential game-tying three-pointer, a really good look, but he misses that. And the Kings suddenly take a 2-1 to series lead, beating the Utah Jazz twice in a row, In a diff, well, the game, the first win was an offensive showcase for the Kings, scoring more than 100 points. But game three in Sacramento, they defeated the Utah Jazz in a defensive battle. That kind of message being sent to the rest of the league, right? Here's this young Kings team taking on an established product in the Utah Jazz. Not only did they beat them in Utah in game two by outscoring them, in game three, they beat them by playing their game, a defensive, grinded out style inside battle. And suddenly the Kings, with home court advantage, are one win away from knocking off the Utah Jazz, the three seed, the Kings of the six seed, one win away from knocking them off and moving on to the next round of the playoffs. Vlade Divac, like I mentioned, he was the hero in this game. 22 points, 14 rebounds, five assists. Chris Webber, 10 points and eight rebounds. So a bit of a quiet game for him, but of course he's still Chris Webber. And Jason Williams, another impressive game going against John Stockton. 12 points, eight rebounds and six assists. And for the Kings... That was their first home playoff win in the Sacramento history of the Kings organization. 
So that was a major night in so many ways. So Kings have a 2-1 series lead. Game four is next. Game four is at home. There's so much excitement, and this series would get even more dramatic than it already was. You'll learn more about that in game four and five on tomorrow's Locked on Kings podcast. But coming up next, you're going to hear from the G-man, Gary Gerald, who is there calling these games. He's going to share his memories from game two in Utah, game three in Sacramento. That's coming in just a second. Before that, though, I want to let you know that today's episode is brought to you by Built Bar. The best part about Built Bar is not only how delicious it is and not only how healthy it is, it's the variety of amazing flavors that they have, like coconut, raspberry, my favorite, mint brownie, double chocolate. All these bars are covered in 100% chocolate. They're soft. They're easy to chew. They truly taste like candy bars. I'm not just saying that. And they are healthy. 17 to 18 grams of protein, calories ranging from 130 to 180, only four to five grams of sugar, and only four to five grams of net carbs. All uh, tasty flavors, amazing, and all healthy for you. And you can try all of these flavors by getting a mixed box your first time on Built.com. Go and order a mixed box. They'll send you a bunch of different flavors. You can try them all out, which ones you like. And then when you order your second box, you can pick which flavors you want them to send, how many uh, that you want them to send to you. That's what my wife and I do. Go to Built.com to get your mixed box or your second or third box and make sure you use promo code, uh, promo code LOCKED15. You'll get 15% off your order. Again, that's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. And the Locked On Kings podcast is brought to you by our friends over at betonline.ag. BetOnline is back and better than ever. All eyes on the gridiron as teams are back to start another football season. As always, BetOnline is your number one spot for all the pro and college football action this season. With a new updated site and interface, even more odds, props, and contests, betonline.ag continues to be the number one source for everything football. Head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today to receive your 100% welcome bonus. That's double your initial deposit just for signing up. And don't forget to use promo code NFL100. From football to basketball, boxing, right to your favorite Vegas casino games, don't wait to take advantage of their amazing offers available for the 2021 season at Bet Online, your online sportsbook experts. Well, game two went significantly better for the Kings. Still in Utah, they won 101 to 90. People remember one moment in particular from this game, G-Man, early on in the first quarter, and that's Chris Weber shoulder checking uh, John Stockton as he uh, tried to cut to the basket, really trying to send a message to the Jazz that the Kings weren't going to be any kind of pushovers and that that 30-point blowout in game one was not um, indicative of, of how good this team was. What do you remember in particular about that moment and the effect that it had on that series? Well, I think it made a statement clearly. And in my memory, looking back that many years in so many games, I don't re- recall a specific feeling at the time, but as I think back and you, and you look at, you know, the impact of what Weber did and the fact that his veteran presence and the fact that he seemed to know you know, that this team has got to make a statement. It's got to do something. And when he drops that bomb on John Stockton, it was message delivered big time. And I think that as I look back, and I think I probably wasn't alone in saying, whoa, I mean, there, there, there's an edge to Chris Weber that maybe, you know, we had seen touches of, but maybe not to this extent. And remember, still at that time, the, it was a very physical game. It may not have been like the bad boys of the Detroit Pistons, but it was pretty doggone similar. And, you know, if you did something like that in today's NBA, boom, <laughs> you're, you're going in a heartbeat. I mean, you're in the locker room moaning and groaning. With probably a game or two suspension in addition to that. And <laughs> Weber was issued a, a flagrant foul Uh, On the play, of course, Stockton steps the line, hits two free throws. Not sure he ever missed a free throw in his career with just how automatic he is. And and reliving these games, if there was a word to describe this series, rewatching these games, it's physical. I mean, both Mm -hmm. these teams physical, especially with their big man play, even though uh, Sloan and the the, um, Jazz didn't get the best out of their centers. I mean, even even watching the physicality of Vlade Divac with how he played down low, just very, very physical series. Uh, And... I was reading about game two and I was reading about like the jazz perspective of that moment. Of course, everybody calls it a cheap shot, a dirty foul. And there seemed to be a lot of people saying that 
Stockton was affected by that play and never really looked the same for the rest of the series. Played maybe a little bit hobbled, even though uh, he would have a big moment in game four, which we will get to. Uh, but do you remember at all John Stockton not looking the same after that moment or, or being hurt at all and not having that drastic of an effect? I do not recall anything specifically in, in that realm. I just know that, you know, John Stockton was a very physical player himself. And there were those who were of the mind that he was, he played a sneaky, dirty type of NBA game. I don't know that I buy into that. I just know that he was damn talented and he had ice water in his veins and he expected to win. And he played with a, a physical presence that I say was sometimes sneaky good. Uh, he, he's an amazing competitor. And you match him up with the physicality of a Carl Malone on that front line, and then you throw in the sharpshooting instincts of a Hornacek, I mean, that was a big three. And everybody, most I shouldn't say everybody, many believe that if you're to have success, even in today's NBA, you don't need one superstar. You don't need two. If you've got three in your roster, you're going to make life really tough for any opponent. The, so the series comes back to Sacramento or actually comes to Sacramento for the first time. And these two fan bases, the market size, the the activity of the fan bases, they're very similar, which made a natural rivalry between the two uh, very apparent really from the get-go with the Kings fans counting to 10 and beyond with Carl Malone at the free throw line. That was very apparent. And, and I've heard plenty of stories about the atmosphere at Arco Arena for uh, the Supersonics game a couple of years uh, or a few seasons before, and that being just the the intro to the playoffs in, in Sacramento for the Kings. What was the atmosphere like? Do you remember at all the buzz in that building for game three of the Kings and Jazz? Well, you split on the road after you got whooped by 30 in the first game. You're coming home where you've had success, even though that particular year was a shortened season, as I recall. I think it was a 50-game season. And the Kings, you mentioned, they were the third, uh, sixth seed, but they were number three in their in their uh, division uh, with a 27-23 record, as I recall. So there was there was belief that you know this group that Rick Adelman and Jeff Petrie had put together was really starting to blossom. So expectations were high. I don't think, in my mind, it equaled what we saw in 19 in the mid 90s when the Kings split the first two games. Uh, only the second time they'd been in the playoffs, that was against the Seattle Sonics, and Seattle was loaded at that time. And when the Kings came home after splitting the first two, uh, in my mind, I don't know that there's anything that quite approached the the fervor and and just the amazing energy that was sustained for so long prior to the tip in that game. Now, that being said, this Utah game with the Kings in game number three in the series certainly wasn't very far behind it. And, and now there was, I just think there was maybe more confidence than there was in the mid-90s against Seattle. There, it was just like this ray of hope that behind Mitch Richmond, the Kings might be able to get a job done and really stun the NBA world. Now, with Weber, Divots, Peja, I mean, you look at that roster and you're saying, this is a good bunch. And and they've got, they've got a legitimate shot. So it was a it was exciting. It was extraordinarily exciting. Playoff basketball just takes it to a whole new level. And that impacts everybody from fans to players to coaching staff, the whole organization, uh, broadcasters. It's just uh, it's something that you relish and you cherish and you just you can't get enough of it. And you want it year after year after year. So that was that was an intriguing and a really good time because it was we didn't know it at the time but it was the first of an eight-year run for the kings in the playoffs consecutive years where they played some really good basketball yeah the confidence that the team had in themselves the confidence that the fans had was well placed as in game three the kings were victorious suddenly they have the advantage after being blown out in game one they have a <laughs> two to one series lead but of course this game goes to overtime as all three did uh, during the regular season like uh, i mentioned this game was a low scoring defensive battle uh, and i believe it was the first kings uh, home playoff win 
or oh, yep. sorry, is the first Kings home playoff game since the 96 Sonics, but the first ever Kings home playoff win uh, uh, period. Uh, what did that kind the way the Kings won though? Like we remember them as their incredible passing and the greatest show on court and beautiful to watch. And they would get to that point, but a gritty grind it out overtime yeah. battle. Uh, what did that kind of win you think say for this Sacramento Kings team? who was really putting themselves on the map and, and making or forcing really everybody to pay attention to them. I think it was delivering a message, not only to the fans who followed the Kings, but it was delivering a message around the NBA this is this is a different version of what we've known in the past as the Sacramento Kings. You mentioned the grinded out, the physical nature, overtime competition. Uh, it to me was a major stepping stone because, as we all know, it's such a different game, and and you ratchet up the intensity, you know, almost like a, a, a geographic possession uh, progression, I should say, like you get with the Richter scale and earthquakes. You know, every little notch is magnified so many times. At any rate, it, it was just, it was a huge step for the Sacramento Kings. And particularly after the outcome, we go back to that first game when you got whipped by 30. Now you're playing this game that ends up in the mid eighties and you win it and you've taken a two to one lead. And a lot of people are feeling pretty doggone good, even though you know it's a five game series. And even though you know it's Jerry Sloan, John Stockton, Jeff Hornacek, Carl Malone and the Utah Jazz. Huge thank you to G-Man for joining me here on the Long Don Kings podcast. Always a pleasure to get his insight and his perspective. He'll be back with me on tomorrow's episode for games four and five. And I hope you will be back with me for those episodes to hear how this series wrapped up between the Kings. Well, as you know, it goes to game five. So you know what happens in game four, but it's still the drama, the excitement in this game, and really how this series kicked off what we know as the golden era of Sacramento Kings basketball. You're going to want to hear all about that on tomorrow's Locked on Kings podcast. So I hope you will join me for that. Uh, for those of you who are interested in the NBA 2K22 giveaway, like I said earlier on in the show, uh, I will be announcing the winner on tomorrow's podcast. So I'm extending it by one more day. And if you want to enter, all you have to do is leave a review of the Locked on Kings podcast on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, and then uh, take a screenshot of that review. Either email it to me, Matt George Sports. Uh, at gmail.com or tweet it to me either DM or publicly uh, at Matt George Sack S A C on Twitter. I would love to uh, to hear from you. Also, if you have memories of games two and three, memories of this 1999 Kings Jazz playoff series at all, please send those to me. Uh, and also, if you're watching on YouTube, leave those in the comment section down below. I appreciate your support. Can't wait to have you join me for part three of this series. And then actual Kings basketball training camp, everything. It's coming very, very soon here. Uh, so we're soon going to be talking actual Kings. We're going to be looking forward to the start of the 2021, 2022 Sacramento Kings season. Hopefully the year where the Kings punch their ticket to the playoffs like they did in 1999. Enjoy the rest of your day. I can't wait for you to join me on the next podcast. Until then, my name is Matt George. You have been listening to Locked on Kings, part of the Locked on Podcast Network.